The ocean is a vital lifeline for the planet. It provides us with food, jobs, and recreation. It connects us to the world's markets and peoples and is a source of medicines and clean energy. Putting a sustainable blue economy at the heart of ocean management is essential for our ocean, our people, and our prosperity. Well, we're heading into the uh, second to the last panel of the day. We've heard from some fantastic speakers today on the climate ocean nexus, uh, about sustainable fisheries, and about challenges and opportunities that uh, we in the Pacific communities face.
Thank you very much, Minister Corella Besso. Um, and our final pa last pa uh, panelist is Dr. Sakaguchi of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much to introduce me. Uh, I, it's my great honor to be here uh, representing uh, Sasakawa Peace Foundation within the group of uh, Nippon Foundation as was uh, introduced at the beginning of this uh, afternoon. Actually, we, Saska Peace Foundation, together with Nippon Foundation, have uh, supported uh, the Palau uh, here, not only for this uh, uh, our ocean uh, conference, but uh, supporting the, uh, the Coastal Guard uh, fleet vessels and also the training of the Coastal Guard uh, people. Okay, uh, let me say the blue economy as a game changer, particularly uh, for small island and uh, developing states. And the question is always, who have the ownership of the ocean and the marine resources? It's an easy question, but it's a tough question to answer. And the key word, in our views are core benefits and synergies as well as trade-offs. And let me explain the sustainable fisheries. The question is how we can maximize the revenue uh, from the income to keep up the sustainability. And there is one uh, good example uh, in Suruga Bay, Japan. What they are doing is uh, provide the information what kind of species and how many uh, fish are in a fixed net before landing. And then consumer, uh, including fish market and also uh, sea, seafood restaurants and also in the, each individual consumer take a look at the information from the fisheries and then register which species and how many uh, fish they want. And then eventually fishermen landing on the data of the consumer to minimize the waste and also minimize the cost for transportation and minimize the cost for opening the market. So that is a, a good example to realize uh, sustainability in, in a fisheries. And let me move on the, the sustainable in the tourism. Tourists obviously drop some amount of money when they are making the tour, but at the same time, they also leave waste and also carbon dioxide you know, by their activities. And then what is an important achieve sustainable tourism? My answer is nature preservation and local people empowerment from the viewpoint of long term is the most important issues. With the empowerment of local people the community can be resilient in the short-term impact, such as pandemic or the short-term fluctuation of the tourist flows. And coastal marine offshore renewable energies is another potential as have been discussed this morning and this afternoon is a, is a potential for blue economies. We must continue to support investment in technology and innovation. For this purpose, we need to do the assesses for the potential energy harvesting based on topological and also physical uh, condition of the coastal and ocean. At the same time, we also need to cross-sectoral and multi-stakeholder collaboration 
among renewable energy promotion, sustainable fisheries, aquaculture, and tourism to multiply environmental and socioeconomic benefits. The co-benefit I mentioned at the beginning, co-benefit promotion and trade-off optimization are particularly important for offshore wind power energy development, not to hamper fisheries, but to instead generate co-benefit. That's a point of uh, renewable energy. Sustainable aquaculture also provides uh, potentials. Science and technology within community-based resources management for aquaculture are quite important and it will be the resilient to climate such as seawater temperature rise. And so far, uh, there are a wide range of uh, enable policy and institutional factors required to promote sustainable blue economies, to better utilize natural capital and promote sustainable blue economies, we must ensure enabling policies, finance, technology, science, traditional knowledge, human resources, and stakeholder empowerment and partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sakaguchi. And thank you to all of our panelists for the thoughtful uh, insights. Uh, now we would like to move to a short uh, Q&A uh, for everyone. Ambassador Janssen, I understand that the Norwegian government emphasizes and has considerable experience in integrated ocean management. Can you share with us why you, say, uh, why you see sustainable ocean planning as a key tool to achieve a sustainable ocean economy? Sure, yeah. So um, the maritime area of Norway is six times the size of our land area. So the ocean is really fundamental to our livelihoods and our uh, future. Uh, and in, management, in managing this, this resource, the integrated uh, ocean management plans have been really crucial. We started this maybe 20 years ago. It's really about balancing various interests, in our case mainly fisheries and oil and gas, and also concerns about, about pollution. Now, the sustainable ocean uh, planning, which is uh, high on the agenda of the, uh, of the uh, high-level panel at the moment, is really putting uh, sustainability at the center uh, of, of this process in all its aspects, uh, both uh, you know, society, economy, and, and the environment, and to create an, an inclusive uh, process uh, at the same time. Now, this is a very important topic, uh, and you can learn more about it tomorrow morning at the side event at the Palau Community Center. Indeed. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Janssen. Uh, now, let us uh, focus on some key blue economy uh, sectors. Ambassador O'Flaherty, how can we make sure that shipping is part of the sustainable blue economy? Well, uh, I mean, I'd say shipping is a complex sector. It's an interconnected sector, and it's inherently a global sector. Um, and while we're starting to see the solutions to decarbonize the sector coming forward, we need to do a lot of work to scale those up, um, to match the scale of the climate crisis, and also to make sure um, that they're at a cost um, that's sustainable for, for industry. So I think that's a really big challenge. I'd say that the work of the International Maritime Organization based in London is obviously key. We need global solutions to tackle what is inherently a global problem. As I mentioned, we need to ensure that we're raising the ambition um, of our targets for full um, em removal of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, um, but we also need to be setting quite ambitious uh, medium-term targets as well. Uh, and I think in, in that regard, I'd also like to commend our US and Danish colleagues um, for the initiative at Glasgow around um, the zero emission shipping um, by 2050. Um, declaration. I'd encourage um, all governments here today, if you haven't already done so, um, to join us um, uh, in signing um, that declaration. And I think this kind of plurinational um, initiative has a really important role to play alongside the IMO. So um, the Clyde Bank declaration, um, the declaration I've just mentioned on zero emission shipping, but also initiatives such as the um, COZEV um, initiative from the cargo uh, shipping sector are all really important. And I think I'd be encouraging 
every government represented here today to look at signing up to those, but also calling on our business and non-state actor colleagues and to be supporting action in that area as well. Thank you very much, Ambassador O'Flaherty. Uh, now turning on to Mr. La Camera, ocean and offshore renewable energy te technologies are some of the promising renewable energies for small island developing states or SIDS who can utilize the vast ocean. Um, what are the strengths and weaknesses of SIDS in this field? Uh, one of the weakness, we start with the bad news, no? <laughs> is perhaps some timing for some of the island the sites of the island itself. So the fact that uh, in principle may be enough, enough markets for selling the energy produced. Yeah. Uh, this could be a weakness. But the other, from the other side, the, the, the benefit and advantage are enormous. I think this is an ideal, in ideal place for having an offshore and tidal technologies be put in place. What is important is that to understand that uh, for feeding the energy system of the seeds, is not necessary a big amount of money. Our estimates say that this is not that uh, a barrier for that. What is important is the international cooperation will focus exactly on what is needed to be done. On this, I have always to talk about our initiative, the Lighthouse Initiative, and also take the opportunity to uh, thank uh, through the Ambassador of Norway, of Norway, Norway for their uh, continued support on this initiative. So we have to find a way. One they have suggested today is bring ideas for projects in the context of the NDCs that we have prepared, prepared together. We have supported 72 countries on preparing the NDCs. So we have assessed 44 renewable assessment, including the islands. So trying to take profit of this instrument trying to work together. I think we cannot say something that will be valid for everyone. The only thing that is valid that we have to work hard and do our job. So it is important that we find solution in the context of what are the own our capacities and tasks. Thank you very much, Mr. La Camera. Um, Minister Corolla Vesau, what does sustainable mean, sustainability mean to you and to the unique nature of the tourism industry? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sustainability is how we can develop policies and uh, initiatives for growing economy without uh, sacrificing future generations to enjoy the same resources and environment that we have today. For us, the means uh, preserving the health of our oceans and the stability of our climate. For our part, our entire development agenda is built around the principle of sustainability. We mapped out a decarbonization plan through the, our national policies, such as the Green Growth Framework, National Development Plan, and the Low Emissions Development Strategy, mm -hmm. and the nationally determined commitments. But because we know we need the entire world to share our commitment, our Prime Minister Frank Bidenmarama has been a champion for small island developing states in the international arena and a fierce fighter for action to hold the damage to the environment, especially the oceans and cut carbon emissions. So in a word, sustainability for Fiji means solidarity from the rest of the world. We know that we must do and what we must do, and we hope our example can inspire others to follow suit. Fiji depends on the ocean for transport. It is our link to international and domestic markets, mm. a source of livelihood and food and a major tourism attraction. And that is where our efforts are most fo focused. Partnership are key for us, and it's the reason we are here. To accelerate our recovery and ensure we are in a state of readiness for future shocks, as we require the right resources, the right expertise, and the right partnership that harness multilateral instruments. <laughs> Fiji, with its fellow Pacific Islands in 2019, pledged to de decarbonize the shipping, uh, domestic shipping fleet by 2050 as part of our net zero commitments. Mm -hmm. At the multilateral level, we are pushing for commitment on disciplining fish, fisheries subsidies. The World Trade Organization has not been able to get convergence on the disip, discipline for nearly two decades. This is because the biggest subs, subsidies are trying to dilute the disciplines into irrelevance. 
But these disciplines are critical for our region, which maintains the healthiest stock of marine life. And also, Fiji's position is that as part of our commitment to sustainably made, manage the ocean, deep sea bed mining should be banned in this decade in favor of exploration. Mm -hmm. We require continued technical support in capacity building and acknowledge sharing. We need development partners to work with us in stimulating investment opportunities to drive COVID-19 recovery and resilience across the tourism value chain and a focus on refinancing, greening, and bluing the industry. In order for Fiji to, transist, for, to transition to a climate resilient economy, we need to mobilize resources and expertise. We need to address barriers such as climate change awareness, knowledge, technology adaptation. Transformation, transformative change will only be realized through accelerated, scalable, and finance initiatives. And we can do this with our coalitions and partnerships. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister Carla Besau. Now, um, Dr. Sakaguchi, uh, what would be your suggested strategy for capacity development uh, for creating sustainable blue economies, particularly for, particularly for Pacific Island countries? Thanks. Well, uh, from my understanding, to realize sustainable ocean and also to have our future Earth is our generation responsibility. But uh, we have many targets uh, at the milestone of uh, 2025 or 2030 or 2050, right? Yeah. We discussed before. And then the most important thing is to train and also involve young generation. Otherwise, I cannot live at maybe at 2050, I'm not sure. But uh, then uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's important to have young generation to be involved in ocean issues. And that's why we, Saskia Peace Foundation, uh, invited and support youth generation, 17 youth at this conference. But uh, in addition, with the great initiation of Norway, they have Stadrad Lemko worldwide uh, expedition with tall ship and uh, we're going to support uh, Palau uh, young generation, youth generation, together with some other island countries, uh, youth generation on board together uh, from the expedition from Koro to uh, Yokohama, certain numbers we, Saskia Peace Foundation, will support. So my answer is uh, younger generation, youth generation, they are our precious stone and we have to polish, and then they can shine. In that time, we are set some targets. That's my answer. Thank you very much, Dr. Sakaguchi. <laughs> and uh, thank you to all of our distinguished panelists uh, for the re rich and inspiring discussion today. Um, you have given us both real world, uh, real world examples of how to invest in the sustainable blue economy and the hope that together we can steer the ship towards ocean health and resilience. And now to close today, I would like to end with a quote uh, by His Excellency Sorangel Whips Jr. He said, we are racing against time to save our ocean. To remain ahead in this race, in this race, we must be like the Kabekel, Palau's fastest war canoe, that depended on each crew member to fulfill their duties. Similarly, we must each take responsibility and work in unison to protect our ocean, our people, and our prosperity. Our survival depends on swift and collective action. Now, let us take those words to heart. <laughs> 